start. Um, but let's. So welcome officially. Uh, so glad that you're here. Uh, like Jennifer just said, put your name, title, organization, and email into the chat for uh, people who might be new here. I'm Wendy Elmo with BrainLinks, and that's Jennifer Raymond with BrainLinks. Paula Denslow is also here from BrainLinks. Uh, we love it when you chat in the um, in the uh, in the chat. So feel free to share. Um, if you want to say hello to anybody, feel free. We want everybody to get connected and meet people, especially chat as it relates to rural health and whatever your system of support is. So here's how today will go. We'll do housekeeping and updates. I'll do it. I have a few things today. Then we'll have our topic specific talk on rural health. That's really the meat of everything today. Uh, We'll have any take any questions that you have for the speakers. We'll then discuss intersectionality and how uh, issues in rural health impact your system of support. And I'll talk about how it impacts brain injury. And then we will uh, talk about ways to make systems change. So please, these are better when everybody is willing to talk. So please share, ask questions, um, share issues that you've had, and then we'll have um, a closing, we'll have a survey. So on to the housekeeping. I just wanted to bring this back. This was a slide that I showed in the beginning based on everybody's answers to the question, what do you hope to get out of this? What do you hope to, to get out of being a part of Tennessee Brighter Futures? And if you look, a lot of them are related to resources. So we have like homeless resources, brain injury information, that's really probably resources, information about them, training resources. So have we just put them all under the same thing, resources would have been real big, right? Because the bigger the word is, means the more people said it. So we're so happy that that's what people are looking for because that's what we've been able to provide with all of these. And from each meeting, you get what we call resource pages on that topic. So um, look for those afterwards. And I'll talk about those again in a minute. Um, so you should have gotten the chronic pain resource pages originally sent by Jennifer if you're searching your email on July 17th but right following that meeting. And uh, please send those pages out. If you haven't already, put them in, uh, in your newsletters. If you feel like sharing in the chat one thing that you learned from that meeting or how you shared that information, we really wanna know how you've shared it. Again, I'll talk about that in a minute. On our website, the Tennessee Brighter Futures part of the Brain Links website, you go there, you look for the uh, the logo for Tennessee Brighter Futures, click there, and then you'll see the system of support page will come up. Um, actually, it'll be an intro page. If you click on that, I call it a flower, that those overlapping circles at, at the top is where you'll get to this page. If you click on that, you'll get on all the separate circles. And you click on the one that you're interested in learning more about, let's say it's substance use, and you can click there and that page will come up. And over on the right-hand side, you'll see a recording of that. You'll see uh, the uh, PowerPoints that are there. There's, for accessibility uh, issues, there's a, a text document of it as well. Uh, and the resource pages are there. You can find them all there for, for each one. Um, I'm putting together a binder. I've heard other people are doing the same thing. I like paper, but you can put them in a file. I have them in a, uh, an electronic file too, so that Whenever you need to get to them, you can just find them uh, right there. So that's what you'll see on the right-hand side. Uh, so coming in, I, I kind of lied a little bit. Uh, actually, I was mistaken. Last meeting, I said that these were going to start coming out in September. We've pushed it back to November. We have created an infographic on brain injury and each of the the comorbid areas that we've been discussing so far. And uh, that will inclu include today for, uh, for rural health. 
And these are available. There's a front and a back and it goes through brain injury and the intersectionality with that system of support and some things that you can do and some resources. And these are available in English and Spanish. And again, we're just going to do the full launch in November. Uh, so I said earlier, please, please share these resources, the resource pages. They have been shared over 92,000 times. We know that 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 number is higher, but we don't know what it is because we stumble upon where somebody has put it on a training page because we're we're really connected with a lot of you and we're checking out your pages and referring people to all of you. So, uh, and we get your newsletters. So if we see something there and you haven't told us about it, we usually send back to you and say, hey, how many people receive that newsletter? But please, if, if we've missed it, then uh, please let us know and uh, we want to be able to keep track. And that's in part for you too, especially if you are a grant-based organization, we can share this information with you and you can say, hey, I'm part of this group that, uh, and we've made this, this level of impact. So please let us know. Um, like if you watch the video from the chronic pain one with your team, let us know how many people were there. So you can share it through email blasts and newsletters. Um, you can have a mini conference and watch the video, put your put a link to uh, Tennessee Brighter Futures or specific resource pages on your website, share via social media. Again, the, the goal is to be getting all of this out to our frontline providers. They're not all here on the call. Um, they're out getting the job done, uh, like, like many of us are, all of us are in different ways. And we wanna get these resources to them so that when they have someone who comes through their door that has maybe another comorbidity and another issue that they're dealing with, they're alerted to be looking for it and then they know what to do about it, how to screen, how to provide resources, how to get them to you maybe. Um, all right, and now on to the main part of today, uh, we're talking about rural health. And so this, just to put this in context, we have been, so up until today, we've been talking about some of these, what I'm kind of calling a comorbidity. There's better words for that. Uh, but these main areas that tend to overlap with each other, like mental health, substance abuse, uh, brain injury, domestic violence, chronic pain. And today is our first step into some of the um, social determinants of health. How do those things impact our, our people and these other systems of support? So we're gonna be talking about that today. Um, next, the next meeting in November is on uh, racial and ethnic minority healthcare issues. Uh, that'll be another uh, sub, uh, social determinants of health area. So our presenters today are Dr. Tamara Chavez Lindell from the lead epidemiologist from the Division of Health Disparities Elimination, the Tennessee Department of Health. Um, Allie Crampton, Safety Net Director from the Tennessee Department of Health Office of Rural Health. JC Warrell, the Executive Director of the Rural Health Association of Tennessee. And then I'll come back at the end to give you an overview of the Tennessee Charitable Care Network. They're not able to be here today because this is the last day of their annual conference. And you'll see the other, um, the groups that make up this rural health group system of support. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, just in, a, in, oh, oh, yes. And a special shout out to Mindy Goff of the uh, Office of Rural Health, who helped, who wasn't able to be here today, but uh, helped us to put this together today. So um, in one moment, this is our, I think, believe we're already recording. Um, uh, we are. I'm gonna, excellent. Okay. So I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Tamara Chavez Lindell, and you can take it from here. Great. Thank you, Wendy. Um, so for future reference, everybody just calls me Dr. T. That's a whole lot easier than going through the big, long, hyphenated double last name. <laughs> Hitting people with that double barrel is, is quite a lot sometimes. Um, so let me get my, my screen shared here, and we'll see if we can uh, see if we can get this going. All right.
Come on. Does not. There we go. All right. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate this opportunity to talk a little bit more about some of the programs that our state office of rural health administers and uh, has available for practitioners, clinicians of all sorts all across the state. And we wanted to sort of share some of those, those resources and that information with you. Um, we do also have a whole lot of information that's available on our health disparities elimination um, website that has, you know, we have information about rural health issues kind of more broadly and health disparities very broadly um, across the state. We've recently released our first state um, health disparities report and that is available on the website as well. We didn't actually link to that today since we wanted to, to really focus on rural health issues. Um, but so that's a talk for another day. We can go even deeper into some of the health disparities that we see. And most of them, what we, most of what we see in the state really is um, very dependent upon where people live. We know that geography plays a huge role. So that's definitely a, an area for a discussion and we can, we can go into that a little bit more. So today I'm sitting in um, to kind of go over some of the, the issues that that Mindy Goff would have addressed. Um, she is out on maternity leave right now, so we're very excited for her. Um, but so Allie and I are going to be picking up the pieces. Um, but I think we'll I think we'll do okay. But if there are things that you have questions about, feel free to ask. If we can't answer them, we will get to Mindy and we will get back to you. <laughs> All right. So one of the programs that the state health department runs um, is the Let's see, I can't get that to hide. Can you guys see that? Okay. Uh, is the State Loan Repayment Program. Now, this is known by its very unfortunate acronym of T-SLURP. Um, you know, it is what it is. I didn't make it up. I would change it in a heartbeat if I could, but I'm not in charge of that. So, the State Loan, loan Repayment Program. Uh, it's a very, <clears throat> it's a very important program that we that we run. Um, it provides educational loan repayment opportunities to practitioners throughout the state. There are some very specific requirements. It has an initial two-year service obligation. People have to be in full-time or part-time practice. Um, they need to be at either an ambulatory primary care site um, and that will, they have to be at an ambulatory non-primary care site and it has to be either a public nonprofit or a private nonprofit facility. Um, and additionally, the facility needs to be located in one of the federally designated uh, HIPSAs or health professional shortage areas that are across the state. Those locations are, are available on the HRSA website. Um, and you can also see the counties that are um, health resource shortage areas, which is a slightly different term that we use within our program um, on the Tennessee Department of Health's website as well. So if providers are uh, eligible, they can receive up to $50,000 for that initial two-year service obligation period. Um, this, of course, is dependent upon getting the funds appropriated each year from the legislature. But so far, fingers crossed, it has gone well, and we've been able to provide um, relief for, of debts for uh, a number of, of uh, qualifying practitioners. Additionally, if people are, are enjoying that or want to continue um, having some of their, their loan repayment or loans repaid, they can renew their service contract and they will get up to $20,000 per additional year. So that is um, a really exciting program. There are a number of different specialties um, who are eligible. So primarily what we're focused on is ensuring that we have, as we said, primary care access in these underserved areas. So we're looking for we're looking for physicians. Um, that's the largest group that we're looking for. But additionally, uh, we can cover dentists and midwives, nurse practitioners, uh, pharmacists, RNs, and then a whole range of behavioral and mental health professionals as well. <clears throat> there are some specific requirements for this. Um, people who want to participate must be either U.S. citizens or U.S. nationals. Uh, they have to be licensed to practice in Tennessee currently, and they need to be working at an eligible site already or have already accepted a position that will begin within 30 days or 60 days, excuse me, of when they, um, when they submit the application. So they have to be either already working or just about to. These funds can only be used to repay qualifying educational loans. And as we said before, they have to commit to a two-year period of service initially working um, either full or part-time. And of course, the, the reimbursement amount is contingent upon the, um, the number of hours they work per week. Mm -hmm. 
So there are also some requirements for the sites that they would practice at. As you said, they need to be ambulatory sites, uh, either public or private nonprofit primary care sites. But additionally, the sites have to sign and say that they will uh, support a practitioner involved in the program. They have to confirm that they provide primary care services. They have to provide uh, proof that they are within a federally designated uh, HIPSA area. Uh, and they need to provide services to Medicaid and Medicare patients, as well as accept CHIP um, and provide a sliding fee scale for any uninsured patients. So they there are really some, some um, limitations on those sites, but we feel that these are very reasonable apps to make sure that we are extending care as broadly as possible. If anyone is interested, the application cycle will be starting up this fall. Um, the exact date is still still hanging out there a little bit. We're waiting on a few more tweaks to the application process, uh, but that is anticipated to happen in November. So you can keep checking back. The website is available there, either the shortened website or through the QR code. The uh, applications will be due um, in early early in 2025, probably in January. And then the selection process, the review, making sure that all of the documentation uh, that's necessary has been has been submitted uh, before those contracts can be processed. And then once that goes goes through, the people should be able to start receiving their um, their repayments sometime in mid spring. So if you have additional questions specifically about T Slurp, our contact is Denisha Maddox, and she is more than happy to answer lots of questions, and we can put you in contact with her as well. All right. So let's see. The next one that we have. <clears throat> is the Conrad 30 or J1 visa waiver program. So this is a program that occurs all across the United States. It utilizes uh, physicians or medical graduates who uh, come to the US on exchange visitor visas. And this allows them to then participate in either work or study-based exchange programs and stay here in the, US, in the United States. It allows them to waive some of the um, the home residence requirements that would normally require individuals who have come in a particular visa category to go back to their country of origin before being able to reapply. Uh, and this just cuts that that uh, wait time out. And so this is designed to address the shortage of qualified doctors in underserved areas. Eligible practitioners for this one are foreign physicians who have completed primary care residency in the U.S., um, so meaning that they have gone through all of the, the steps to um, have their, their uh, foreign uh, training validated here in the United States. And additionally, they need to have a medical specialty. And so they have to require or they have to provide medical care to all underserved Tennesseans. Again, like we discussed before, they need to have a sponsoring employer. Most of them need to average a 40 hour per week service at one of the qualifying healthcare facilities. Um, additionally, this one is not two, but a three year contract that they need to have in place with their facility. They have to be eligible for medical licensure here in the state, uh, and they need to be board eligible in their particular specialty. The way the structure, the program is structured, all 50 states have a version of the, the J-1 visa program um, that is, that's allowed, but each state kind of develops its own rules and guidance that are a little bit specific. Each state gets 30 slots per year. The last number of years, we have filled all 30 slots, which is great news. That means 30 additionally highly trained, very competent physicians in areas that might otherwise be underserved for these particular specialties. Um, so if you have other questions about that, again, we're happy to respond to them with the information that we have, or we can put you directly in contact with Ann Cranford, who is the director for the J-1 visa program for the state. All right, so that covers my part. I'm gonna pass it over to Allie to talk, but I'm gonna keep advancing slides for her. Hi, Dr. T, thank you very much. Um, I am Allie Crampton. I'm the new director of the Uninsured Adult Healthcare Safety Net Program. Next slide, please, ma'am. So um, the adult, the safety net program is um, basically in response to a uh, lack of insurance 
um, across the state. It kind of tries to fill in the gap um, of the other programs where Ted Care, Medicare, Medicaid, where those might be lacking. Um, and as you all know, with rural health, um, adequate health insurance or, or poor access to health um, care services or lack of health insurance um, can lead to overall poor health outcomes for individuals. Um, so for specifically for safety net, um, right now we are trying to do a um, RFP, a request for um, proposals or grant applications to um, for the next round of applicants to highlight the counties that don't have any um, safety net providers. Uh, and majority of those counties happen to be rural. So that's how we are trying to um, assist with that issue there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is just a graphic from our FY23 safety net annual report, um, the uninsured adult population proportion of the United States versus Tennessee. And I think we all know here that Tennessee um, runs above average compared to the national average. Um, so we, yes, as stated before, I work for the Tennessee Department of Health, the State Office of Rural Health specifically is where um, the safety net program is administered out of. Um, it helps provide funds to providers uh, to see patients who are uninsured adults in the ages 19 to 64 who live in Tennessee. Um, and that just says that they're like a, not even a proof of residency, but that they are at a um, location in Tennessee or that they do live in Tennessee. A lot of our locations, um, not a lot of them, some of our locations treat homeless individuals. And for those individuals, the uh, residence or the location is actually that clinic. Um, the services that are provided um, are done by FQHCs, the Federally Qualified Health Centers, and CFBs, our uh, community and faith-based clinics. Um, we have dental organizations, nonprofits, uh, rural health centers, and then our project, our five project access entities who provide uh, care coordination services. Um, in addition to those, we also have local health departments um, that provide primary care, um, acute care, and dental care services to the Tennessee uninsured population. Um, this is a, a more visual representation of the funding. So um, the uninsured adult health care safety net funds, um, when we, it's appropriated or, or given to us by the legislature every year, is divided um, into between the Department of Health and the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse. And that funding um, is separate from us and that goes towards behavioral health services um, that include, but are in addition in extra, I guess, to um, normal primary care behavioral services. Um, and the services that we see for our primary care providers, they can do uh, a few behavioral health things, but it's, it's primarily just, um, the goal is to have funding for these providers and set up um, a continuity of care, if you will, so that they have somebody to see at least twice a year. Um, but our funding, oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. I can, I, I don't need to focus on that, there we go. Um, <clears throat> so for FY23, a safety net was allocated $21.9 million and that's divided again into the two service categories that Primary Care Plus um, makes up uh, primary care and dental services, um, and then behavioral health services. And then um, project access is the care coordination services. And between all, all of those, um, there were over 190,000 unduplicated patients for FY23 and um, almost 337,000 visits across the state. Um, the primary care access site. So Dr. T did a fantastic job with our map here that um, shows all the different locations for our net clinics across the state. Um, you can see that there are definitely counties that don't have access to that. And again, as I mentioned, we are focusing on trying to um, allow other uh, new safety net providers or existing safety net providers to open up services in those counties. Um, but in all, um, there's 56 local health department clinics um, that are, and 16 of those are designated as FQHCs. 
um, and then 118 FQHCs that are non-local health departments, uh, and then 44 community and faith-based clinics across the state. Um, for dental care access, this is similar to the slide before. This just shows numbers across the state for access to uh, dental care for the safety net or for uninsured adults across the state. And there's 45 local health departments that offer dental care services, six of which are FQHCs, and then 20 other FQHCs that are not local health departments, uh, and 20 community faith-based clinics. Um, so project access is our care coordination or specialty care providers. There's five of them. Um, they are in uh, Memphis, Nashville, Chattanooga, Knoxville, and Johnson City or Appalachian area. Um, they do not provide direct clinical health um, care services, but instead coordinate um, patients with access to specialty care providers, um, laboratory services, diagnostic services, preventative care, management of social services uh, to, um, and this is all done through volunteer providers. Um, they sign up to say that they will do a certain number of um, hours or clinic hours um, in return for uh, continuing education credits. Uh, so they provide the specialty care that maybe a normal primary care provider could not provide. Um, the network of volunteers provides services to um, anywhere to 3,500 to 5,200 uninsured adult Tennesseans per month. Um, so in addition to Safety Net, I, I administered two other programs. Um, the Smile and 65 program with Interfaith Dental Clinic of Nashville, and then Smile 180, um, the Safety Net Denture program. Smile on 65 is for um, mobile adults over the age of 65 to be able to get um, dentures if they need them and for them to be paid for um, with Interfaith Dental Clinic of Nashville who administers that program. We They have a grant with us we give them the money to do that. They fulfill those services within the grant contract. Um, and then Smile 180 is through the um, Smile 180 Foundation that is facilitated by Delta Dental of Tennessee. And the Smile 180 um, is for safety net providers, dental providers, and they do uh, things like restorative services or uh, denture program, dentures and implants for that program too, for just the safety net patients. So ages 19 to 64. Did I, oh, I flew through that. Sorry about that. Um, we can flip through the annual report or um, when you guys get this, uh, we will, I think, send you guys the slides. Um, you guys can look through our FY23 annual report. We are in the process of putting our FY24 annual report together now. So as Allie said, you know, we have um, a, a wide range of services that are provided, as you kind of see, and I know we went through a lot of those really quickly, um, but we are more than happy to answer questions about any of those programs or, uh, you know, point you in the direction of, of, you know, how to get hooked up with those resources, how to sign up if you want to be uh, either participate in the, the TSLR program for loan repayment or participate as a provider um, or simply point your you know, figuring out where to point your um, your clients if they need some of these services. So, uh, with that, I think I think that covers all of what we had today. But we're happy to stay on and discuss. That thank one. you, thank you, thank you very much, and uh, thank you, uh, Ali, for that that kind of diagram of the safety net. Because when we were planning all of this, I said, "Oh, well, our folks will know about the safety net from." our talk on substance abuse and um, and Dr. T and uh, and Mindy were like, no, 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 that's a little bit different. So it was nice to hear this other yeah, side of it. It's one pot of funding from um, the legislature that's distributed between the two the two state departments, but yes. Two different safety nets for, for different reasons. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, that was helpful. Anybody have any questions at this point before we switch to um, to JC? All right, uh, so now, Casey, if you'd like, uh, JC Warrell, if you'd like to share. 
Okay, let me get my screen share here. Share. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so glad to be connected with you. I feel like I've been um, hearing about this work for a long time. We've got Destiny Shaw, our membership coordinator on the call. She's been participating, um, but really glad to connect with you and share resources. Uh, Wendy, thank you for sharing uh, that that slide about what members are wanting because that's kind of how we structured so it makes me feel a little bit more confident going into this. I'm JC Worrell, Executive Director, Rural Health Association of Tennessee. We are a nonprofit membership organization with more than 800 members across the state. That includes school health coordinators. So fun fact, Tennessee is the only state that funds their own coordinated school health program. Other states um, are connected with CDC funding and Rural Health Association was really instrumental in getting them up and running. So that's why they're a large part of our membership. Of course, we've got hospitals and clinics, mental and behavioral health providers, community-based organizations, um, anyone that cares about rural health can become a member of our organization. Our mission is to lead the way to a healthy tomorrow throughout Tennessee. We do this through partnerships, education, advocacy, and resources. Our policy priorities are member voted and inputted. So the last survey we did, these are the things that rose to the top, increased provider rate reimbursement, uncompensated care reduction, Medicaid expansion, um, expanded uninsured adult safety net eligibility. So really glad to hear some progress is being made there. Rural health workforce development and then funding for rural communities to address social drivers of health because we believe that rural leaders know best what's for their community and have really innovative ways and ideas on how to do that. I'm just going to really quickly run through some slides, um, paying attention to the time here. So I'll talk about some access to care in Tennessee um, really quickly. I've got some maps for you as well and then uh, cover a few of our programs our rural community opioid response, Tennessee Community Compass, which is a partnership with TenCare and FindHelp.org and some resources and events. So one of the questions I get asked a lot is what is the definition of rule and um, that is pretty complicated. Um, Tennessee has its own definition that focuses basically on if you're not in uh, Shelby County, Davidson, Hamilton, Knox, and Washington, I'm guessing that's Johnson City, um, probably Rutherford as well, it's basically considered rural. We have to use a HRSA definition, um, and uh, so a lot of our uh, statistics and data will be based on that, um, but just an overview of kind of who's where and what in rural health, we've got actually uh, 16 critical access hospitals now, um, more than 270 rural health clinics, 99 rural FQHCs, um, Medicare dependent hospitals, and then we've got hospitals that are in rural, they're just not critical access hospitals and they use a different payment model. So um, you will get copies of the slides, so you'll have access to this, um, but um, obviously all of Tennessee's rural communities are in health professional shortage areas, whether we're talking primary care, mental health, or dental. This is a map of the community health centers across the state. So you see the uh, counties that are not shaded in do not have a federally qualified health center. That means that the only primary care services available in those communities are our health departments who do a great job. I've got another slide on them um, and the services they provide, but we know that all of those services are not uh, provided equally. Some dif have different grants or different programs. Um, so this, these uh, communities here are, when we're talking about uninsured adult safety net, uh, these are the communities that are, uh, do not have primary care provider outside of the health department. Uh, of course, we do have our local and regional health departments. Um, we've got uh, the listing here of some of the slides Dr. Alvarado had shared um, at our conference last fall. So that kind of gives you a visual of what they do across the state. 
And then we've got um, other rural health care facilities that are lesser known, but just kind of wanted to show you the map. Um, for all that we talk about rural health and the challenges of access to care, we actually do have a lot of safety net providers across the state. Um, as far as the federal government is concerned, we do have federally designated rural health clinics. Um, probably less than 10 of those are nonprofit rural health clinics. Um, you've got Vanderbilt and St. Thomas that are technically nonprofit. So they'll be able to apply for uninsured adult safety net funds. Um, but we've got a lot of other providers that see Medicaid and Medicare populations. They also see uninsured, um, but obviously they're disincentivized for doing so. But that kind of gives you, um, in these areas, the kind of beige are um, your urban areas. Um, charitable clinics across the state. So we, our members are um, charitable clinics too in rural communities. Um, again, this slide shows the TCCN member location. Um, and then you'll see that, again, that disparity in West Tennessee. Um, it's no nobody's fault. It's just there's a lot of, um, there are a lot less resources in West Tennessee. So we do focus a lot of time on trying to bring grant dollars to Tennessee and supporting providers there. Um, and then, of course, um, in Middle Tennessee, I think we don't talk about it enough. Those counties down there, Wayne, Lawrence, Giles, uh, Lincoln, and Franklin um, are typically left off the map, uh, no matter what we're discussing. Moving into some of our resources, we do have a, a grant through HRSA, a federal agency for rural community opioid response. We've got a lot of great resources that are available and open to the public. Um, first over here, you can join our R-Core uh, newsletter. Um, this link, um, or you could go to our website, takes you to our Rural Health Digest, which is sent twice per month. Um, and then there's another option if you're interested specifically in opioid um, substance use response there. We've also got some toolkits, a free administering naloxone uh, training, and then uh, Be There uh, campaign resources. So it is recovery month, if you didn't know. Happy recovery month. Um, we've got a lot of uh, free social media graphics graphics that are unbranded that you could use um, in your organization's social newsletters, etc. We also um, started through a contract with Tennessee Department of Health and now it's kind of expanded. Um, we've got a smaller contract um, with TennCare providing enrollment assistance across the state. So um, that hotline, that 866 number at the bottom is um is a number you can call if someone needs um, help either renewing their tank care or looking for health insurance um, we do events every month um, you, i'll point you to our calendar page in a second so you can see what that looks like Rural health equity and language inclusion. This was also developed out of a grant with Tennessee Department of Health. It is not linked on our website. So you all are kind of getting the insider knowledge of this. Um, we've got some uh, recordings as part of a webinar series. And then we also put our traumatic brain injury um, that we worked with Wendy and team on as well. So that is linked there. Um, this toolkit is a little bit different in that it really focuses on language, the words we say, how we say them. Um, so it's just a little bit different lens to topics that it sounds like you all have already been talking about. Um, also with TenCare and FindHelp.org that I mentioned earlier, um, we're working to help connect community-based organizations and nonprofits with providers, hospital systems, and each other across the state. It's called a closed loop referral system. So basically, whenever we make a referral, um, wouldn't it be nice if we know if that person that we referred was actually taken care of? Um, and this is basically a system that TenCare is hoping to implement that will quote unquote close that loop. Um, so our job is to help connect all these different partners, um, and we've got some trainings coming up if you're interested in learning more about that. Um, and this tool as a care coordination strategy, um, we've got regular trainings, uh, kind of intro trainings and uh, advanced trainings on how to claim your programs if you're already listed in that, or if you're not, we can help you add that. Um, 
PS, Community, Community Compass, if it, you're like, oh my gosh, I haven't heard of that, it has not officially launched. Our contract has started and we are working diligently to help organizations um, get in the platform. So we are available to help, but uh, don't feel bad if you haven't heard of this yet because it is still not officially launched. You can go to our website um, for further learning and professional development opportunities. You've got the event page there. Also, um, Destiny does a really great job of keeping everything up to date in our newsletters. Um, coming up is uh, our annual conference. Um, we will be celebrating 30 years of rural health um in knoxville this november this is through a contract with the state office of rural health and um, really great opportunity to connect with all of those different member groups uh, we are really unique in that um, you know a lot of associations will have like one specific kind of provider type and we really do kind of cross over so it's a really great um, opportunity there um, you'll see um, some things, uh, webinars and lunch series advertised on our website um, for rural health clinics. Um, that's because of a specific grant targeting rural health clinics because they've kind of been left out of the conversation in Tennessee for so long. So that's how we've got the funding. But as you'll see here, often Oftentimes there are topics that are relevant to other groups. And then right now as part of our recovery month celebrations, um, we've got um, some webinars, um, recovery and rule. We just had one this week was excellent. Uh, we heard from some people that have been in recovery um, and how uh, being in rule um, can both be a support and be a challenge because of those access issues that we talk about. Um, and then next week we'll talk about uh, more stigma. And then lastly here, um, this is a national resource, but really, really great for you. Um, if you are writing grants, if you're looking for data, Rural Health Info Hub is um, funded, again, HRSA, the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. Um, you can go to this website and you can search um, topics by state um, or by topic, their toolkits, their resources. Um, I did a search for a brain injury um, and you'll see some of the things that come up in there. So again, it kind of gives you um, really good relevant data if rule if you're looking at that intersectionality. And then that is it. Um, sorry, I flew past and hopefully I've left you all some time for some discussion. Um, we definitely hope that you connect with us. Please join our newsletter, follow us on social. Um, and then, of course, myself or Destiny, whose information is also in the chat, are always willing to connect with you. Thank you so much, Stacey. That was great. And um, I loved that we were hearing some things for the first time here. So thank you for sharing with us, Tennessee Writer Futures. Um, you heard it here. Um, before I jump in and talk a little bit about uh, TCCN, um, I had a question for all of you in rural. So in pulling together like a picture of what are the rural healthcare issues that are, are out there, I heard lack of access to care, uh, whether that's lack of access to insurance, lack of access to like programs, maybe not even having programs around. Um, I, I I think probably we heard increased substance use in rural areas that goes along, JC, with your grant. Yeah, I would say um, mental health and substance use always rises to the top of issues our members say that they're concerned about. Um, I think that's also reflective in the Tennessee Department of Health's um, Community Health Council Network. Um, they do those community health assessments, and uh, I'm pretty sure that that's always in their top three of needs as well. Right, and do we do we also see things like um, uh, increased diabetes or um, is obesity an issue in the population? Anything else like that? 
Yeah, um, that's something I could have added in the presentation. Basically, any health measure or health outcome that you're looking at, um, there's going to be a higher prevalence in rural communities um, because of all of the things, right? And so there's another presentation I like to show that kind of shows um, demonstrates that our health is really impacted by our zip code, um, urban and rural communities. Um, so, you know, education, poverty, transportation, all of those social supports can affect all of the things. So um, we're, whatever statistic you're looking at, if it's the state, Tennessee is going to be higher than the rest of the states usually, and your rural communities are going to be higher than those metro communities. We just had a question from Tina Fox in the chat. What about uh, domestic and sexual violence? Would that also be? Yeah, it is actually. And I really encourage you if you can, uh, Desi, if you don't mind, just drop that link to the health equity toolkit um, in the chat. We did do a presentation on that as well, Tina. Unfortunately, our record didn't work. We were devastated. We do want to re-record it, um, but we've got some information about domestic and sexual violence as well. Okay, and so then just related to all that, I would say health education, health knowledge is going to be less in, in some of those areas. Health literacy is typical. I mean, I think health literacy is a challenge everywhere, rural and urban, just because our system is so complicated to navigate. Um, I think probably even some of us on the call would could attest to that. Um, so yeah, but uh, whenever you've got lack of providers, you also have lack of healthcare leadership that can kind of talk about those preventative activities, those resources. Whenever you have less nonprofits in a community, um, you're going to have less resources going out that do that education um, and, and providing of, you know, some tangible resources. Great. Thank you. Any Anything that anybody else wants to add to that? Any issues that they see? All right. In that case, um, or just go ahead and, and chime in. I just want to share uh, a little bit. It was already touched on about the Tennessee Charitable Care Network. Like I said, they weren't able to be here today, um, but I felt like they were important. We've, we have connected with them in the past. Um, so these, I'm not going to go into it a lot because I can't tell you a lot, but I want you to know that these slides are gonna be available to you that you can um, look at. I have, in order, in who they are, they have these two slides with lots of information. And then what I pulled from the website that I really liked was they support, educate, and represent nonprofit organizations that provide charitable healthcare services to low-income, uninsured, and undeserved Tennesseans. And I felt like that was a good way to just pull it together what it is that they do. And uh, I think believe JC just showed this map or one like it that shows where they are and it shows there's medical, there's dental, there's the combined. And there are also those, um, those project access places as well. And um, I think the big takeaway from, from this for me was that their uh, demand exceeded capacity. And I think we're hearing that all over. 80% um, of their patients were uninsured. And for more information about TCCN, you can contact Darren Thomas. And that information will be right there. Any, any questions come to anybody before um, I switch to the intersectionality with brain injury? Thank you for all of the links that you all have been putting into the um, the chat. That's really helpful. Okay, so I want to talk about the intersectionality just for a couple of minutes with brain injury. So uh, people in rural areas are actually more likely to sustain a TBI, to have a traumatic brain injury in the first place. They have more fatalities after 
TBI compared with urban areas, and they're more likely to have worse outcomes. Um, they have la less access to pre-hospital services, to the high level trauma units that are often needed, to the neurosurgical interventions that are needed rapidly, very often, um, and less access to rehabilitation afterwards, which leads into the, the functional outcomes in rural areas are worse. They're not getting the, the treatment that they're needed, the rehabilitation. Um, additional uh, barriers are lack of transportation to be able to get to and from, and that's probably something that would be on that list um, overall, not just brain injury, uh, difficulty paying for health care. And then they also see denial about the seriousness of the injury when it comes to, um, to brain injury. So not a big deal. So I think the education would play a role there. Um, so some common challenges that we see after brain injury are going to be present as well. Uh, memory, new learning, attention, speed of processing, headaches, dizzy and dizziness and balance issues, problem solving, impulse control, communication issues, irritability, frustration, agitation. These are all very, very common brain injury outcomes. And uh, so it could make it harder to do things like budget or apply for housing, pay for your rent hold a job, maintain a property, remember your appointments, remember to take medications, be able to communicate your needs, express what your issues are, and be aware um, even that they need services. That's a big issue with brain injury is lack of awareness. So not even knowing that there's something needed. Um, so best practice is to screen for a prior history of brain injury, if that can be happening. I, it sounds like these clinics are already inundated, um, but being able to screen for a prior history of brain injury, screen for deficits if there is a prior history, um, teach people to use accommodations and uh, follow up with people with brain injury need follow up more often and longer in order to get both their brain injury needs met, but then also to get other needs met because they'll forget about uh, taking their diabetes medication and um, taking their um, their blood pressure medication and following and and getting it renewed and all of those things. Um, so any before I go on, actually, any other? Um, oh, and then and then telehealth is is one possibility as an option um, in in rural areas. That I think we've talked about not always. Uh, first best approach, but uh, but might be able to solve, fill in some holes. Any other thoughts about intersectionality with your area of support? So how, for all of the rest of you out there who work in another area, maybe domestic violence, or have you had any issues with um, people from rural communities having, have you seen these issues? Have you faced them? Client group today, and and um, some of you may work only in urban areas, and I appreciate you being here because I really feel like it's important. It was helpful for me to understand the state as a whole, to really understand all of the issues that we're we're all facing, and to keep in mind, uh, you know, when, when we are maybe dealing with something at a state level, what's everybody dealing with. Wendy, I'll yes. just add for the sake of conversation, um, I, I don't think I said this already, but we never want to pit rule against urban, you know, in when we're talking about lack of access. We know that urban communities have really uh, challenging access issues as well. When it comes to like urban providers, I know you just said, you know, there may be a lot of urban providers here. I just want to stress the importance of our urban providers to our rural communities since we don't have those access to resources. You know, rural people will be seeking care in urban centers. We know that especially for specialty care. Um, but I think that um, knowing these things that you just said about, you know, the, the hesitancy and the education are an important cultural competence piece to be able to serve people in rural communities. That's a very good point. 
about yeah everybody has their own issues right sometimes they're they're the same sometimes they're different um I mean, we can probably learn from each other a whole lot. All right. So please, any at this point, anybody um, chime in. Um, I just want to show you the um, the rural health uh, resource pages. They are not necessarily done. Sometimes we'll take things that come up from today, uh, things that were put in the chat, things that will mention were mentioned that we hadn't found or hadn't been suggested to us and we'll um, put them in there. Uh, so these rural health ones are five pages. These are, um, they always begin with an overview of that area and then of that topic area of that day and then the intersectionality with brain injury. And then they go into um, different screenings. Jen, do you wanna go through these or should we, should we keep on going? We have the time if you want to. Um, I think it would be ideal if we had the opportunity for everybody to have a discussion after we finish the training part of this. And I'll be and I have them on standby if we want to pull those up at the end. Okay, I believe we are complete. So I'll just keep on going to let you know. Um so the resource pages are there. Um, these are just the first three. And um, okay, we, so we can end after this. So if you are watching this, so not anybody who's live here with me right this moment, but anybody who is watching this at a later time, um, please take this survey. It takes one minute. We're gonna show this to everybody who is here in person again at the end. Um, after our discussion, we'll stop recording so that people can feel free to not have the answer to something or to be struggling with something. Um, our next meeting is another social determinant of health area, which is racial and ethnic minority health on November 7th from 1 to 2.30 Central, 2 to 3.30 Eastern. And we can go ahead and stop recording there. <laughs>